All right. Good morning, everybody. Just making sure you're with me. Good morning, good morning, good morning. My name is Stephanie. I'm one of the pastors here at Mill City, and I uh, just want to welcome you once again. We're so glad that you're here to worship with us. Um, I am going to be finishing off a conversation today that I have just loved. I'm very passionate about this. I think that'll be obvious in a few minutes. But it's called Every Tongue, Tribe, and Nation. Every Tongue, Tribe, and Nation. And the, the maybe like the subtitle for this sermon series is Embracing God's Gift of a Multicultural and Multi-Ethnic Humanity. Embracing God's gift of a multicultural and a multi-ethnic humanity. And so we've discussed a lot. So you could go back. We've got all of the sermons online at millcitychurch.com. Anywhere you get your podcasts, you can get our sermons. But we've covered how this diverse mosaic of cultures that God has created in this world is a gift. We've also covered how there is this reality of racism, which I often describe as a curse. This way in which humans will categorize each other, this construct that allows us to think better of certain people and less of other people based on these different realities of the color of our skin. So we've talked about both of those things, but we've also talked about how we get the invitation to be a part of what I like to call reversing the curse. We get to join God in reversing the curse, but it's no shock that there is a curse because oftentimes, I've noticed at least in my life, this enemy that we have often puts a curse and really gets us really entangled in some of the most beautiful things that God's created. When God's done something amazing and something that's a gift, the enemy is often the one that's trying to, to run interference on that stuff. But we get a chance to be a part of reversing that curse. So just what we've covered so far, we talked about how we get to join in God's story of unity but not uniformity. We've talked about how there is a real opportunity for us to need to come and repent and lament over the really painful things that this curse has caused. It doesn't take much of looking around to see how painful and destructive that's been. And so last week, Pastor Mike talked a little bit about the need for repentance and lamenting over that, which God invites us to. And today, I want to finish up the conversation with just some encouragement around some ways that we can take some next steps. There are some really intentional ways that every one of us, wherever we're at, Michael talked last week, you, you want to figure out where you are so you know where you want to go next. That's really what it's about. There's some intentional steps that each of us can take to join God's redemption story, to join in God's work to reverse this curse, to be a part of people who see this gift of God's multicultural, multi-ethnic humanity as something that we get to embrace. So your job today is just to think of maybe one or two things that we talk about this morning that would be next steps for you. And I hope that it can be encouraging for you this morning because this is so important and it's so worth it. So before we do that, let's pray together, okay? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we worship you this morning. We thank you for the privilege that it is to worship here in this public school. We don't take that for granted. God, we pray that you would bless Sheridan School in the name of Jesus, that there would be a difference here tomorrow morning when those kids come, that there would be just your presence would be here, that they would experience your touch, they would know that they are loved, that they are valued, that they are worthy of love. God, we pray that you would empower the teachers and the faculty and the staff. And God, this morning, as we look into your word together, we pray that you would be using your Holy Spirit to teach each one of us what you want to teach us. God, we thank you for the, the promise of your presence that you are a God who is with us. So God, we pray right now that you would release us of, of shame and the things that you don't have for us. Fill this room with your love, with your Holy Spirit, and also allow us to be people who can receive your challenge this morning as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I've confessed many times I'm really bad at the community time questions, and so um, they still keep letting me write them. And somebody, I think Tony's like, we're going to take that from you. So this might be my last community time question. And this one I also think I writ, wrote, and I, and I know it's grammatically incorrect, okay? So I, I couldn't figure it out. So I've got other skills, okay? So the question was, the question was, what do you take a lot of pictures of? I don't think sentences are supposed to end with of. Is that right? Yeah, okay, well, whatever. So... How many of you, call it out, what do you take a lot of pictures of with your phone? <laughs> with your camera. <laughs> what is it? Your children, your dogs, anything else? Nature. Yeah, I was going to say, where's the food people? Come on. You know you're here, the people that take pictures of the food. All right. Where's the people that are like, this is a really dumb question because I don't really take that many pictures? Okay, that's fine. That's cool. That's cool. I just wanted to make sure people knew you were here and you're, you're welcome here. Okay, so that's totally fine. Um, I, I had this fateful day just a while back where my phone did this update and without my permission started to count how many selfies I took. 
Did anybody else realize that? I don't feel like I gave permission to, for that update. And so um, I know we're supposed to be vulnerable. That's like Brene Brown or something. But I am not vulnerable enough to tell you how many selfies there are on my phone. Like that's just not going to happen today. But I'll tell you that it is more than a few, <laughs> okay? And, and in my defense, um, a lot of the, the selfies are, I would suggest, groupies because there's other people in the selfie with me. Yeah, see, some of us, it's the groupie. Now, if you're just like, whatever, I, I'm just saying that you can now see on your phone, many people, if you use your phone for cameras, it'll tell you what you take pictures of. It'll give you like, I don't think I remember asking for an animal or a nature album, but they make them for you. It's crazy. But if I were to take one of your phones, maybe one of you who are actually picture takers, and I were to go through all of your photos, I would not get an entire picture of your life, would I? But those snapshots would give me some understanding of your life. But you and I would have to have a conversation if you wanted to help me understand the deeper aspects of who you are. But the reality is, is these snapshots do give us some information about the big picture of our lives. The snapshots give us an information about the big picture. And so today we're going to finish up this conversation that we've been having, looking at the same text that we've been looking at, Revelation 7. And this text is a, is a picture of the end of God's story. With the kids, we call it the big God story, the end of God's story, this vision of the grand finale, the, the end of God's story. It's this beautiful picture. But there's something interesting if you look really close at the passage that I want to invite you all into today. And that is there is multiple snapshots, uh, kind of almost like flashbacks, little snapshots of the past that are seen in this big end, end finale story. So there's three that I want to point out today. So when I read it, if you've been with us, I want you to just focus on it this time and just say, what snapshots are being mentioned here in this big picture that we see at the end of Revelation 7? Let me give you just a little bit of a context. Um, Revelation is the last book of the Bible. It is a vision that's given of the, the way this grand story of God ends. It's in a type of literature that's called apocalyptic literature. But what many scholars believe is that the author of this book was um, sent out to this island called Patmos, banished to this place probably because of following Jesus. And so while this person is out on this island, they get this vision from God, and they start to write down the vision. But it's an apocalyptic vision, which means there's a lot of images and a lot happening. Now, there is a lot we could talk about about apocalyptic literature, but today what I want you to focus on is this picture within this book of Revelation, which means revealing, God's revealing something, Revelation. God's revealing something about the gift that it is to be people who live in the midst of a multicultural and a multi-ethnic humanity. And here in Minnesota, we have the opportunity to see that next door and right around us in a way that we have never had before, and we're going to increasingly get that opportunity. And we get a picture here in Revelation of this. And so what I want you to pay attention to is, here in this passage, what are the snapshots of the past that are being brought into this big picture story at the end? All right? Because I think the snapshots are going to help us know how we can join in to what God's inviting us into in our in, in this story ourselves, okay? So look for the snapshots when I read this. Revelation 7, starting in verse 9. We'll have it on the screen. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes, and they were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All right, you're looking at it. Are there some stories that you see, these snapshots? Okay, so I'm going to start with the one that at least I noticed is the most obvious. And that is the snapshot going back to the story of Pentecost. The story of Pentecost we find in Acts 2, 1 through 8. The people are singing in one voice, but there's many different languages. They're talking about who God is and declaring who God is. But even though they're speaking many languages, there's a sense of unity. This is what we see in this story in Acts. Let me read it for you in Acts 2. And you can, you can open your Bibles to these, but we're going to have them up on the screen as we look back at these three stories, okay? So let me read for you what happens in the story of Pentecost. If you're familiar with it, think about how it's connected to this big picture story at the end. Acts 2, 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment 
because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? So here we see the Holy Spirit doing something supernatural, right? Giving these people the ability to communicate across cultures in a way that they would not be able to without the Holy Spirit. And so I think an invitation to us that we see in this flashback, in this snapshot, is this invitation to let the Holy Spirit lead us as we pursue intercultural competence and intercultural humility. This phrase that we like to, to use to help us understand what we're trying to do here. The Holy Spirit can help us do this, you guys. It's not just that we have to do it on our own. It's not that we just have to figure it out. But trust the Holy Spirit to open up communication in ways that without the Holy Spirit we couldn't do it. Now, I don't think this often will mean that we'll be given the supernatural gift to speak other languages, but I've actually been present when that's happened before, so it does happen. But I think it probably looks like many different ways where we're given an ability to understand, to be patient, to, to know good questions to ask. The invitation is to let the Holy Spirit lead us as we pursue intercultural competence. I really believe that the Holy Spirit is not optional in this pursuit. We need to invite the Holy Spirit to lead us. And then second invitation I think we see here, when we see this, this crazy picture in Pentecost and how it reflects this story in Revelation 7, these are really big picture experiences. This is something really incredible. I want to suggest that I think it invites us to ask God to give us eyes to see more and more of the big picture. So when we talk about how we are God's kids, that God made us in God's image, the imago Dei is what we often say. What's so wonderful about that is that I have the opportunity when I see any one person to see the image of God in them. And they have the opportunity to choose to see that in me. But you know what? That's just a t tiny, small sliver of God, the image of God in humanity, right? In my culture, the culture, the beauty of my culture, the beauty of the cultures represented in this room, even all the cultures in this room is just a small sliver of the beauty of the image of God when we see all of humanity together. So in this really interesting way, the small picture that we have of culture that we get to pursue our whole lives, we could take our whole lives to learn more and more about the gift that is multicultural humanity, but we would never see, even in our whole lives, this big picture until that story in Revelation 7 comes true, where we get to see this big picture. So I'm going to invite you to do something today. We've never done it at Mill City before. Don't be nervous, okay? It's called Visio Divina. Has anybody done Visio Divina before? Have you heard of Lectio Divina? I know some of you had. I see some nods. So it's Latin. It's an ancient practice. Lectio Divina means divine listening. So people might listen to scripture and see if the Holy Spirit speaks through the, the scripture as they meditate on it. Well, Visio Divina is divine seeing. And oftentimes, an invitation to do Visio Divina is through art. To, to look at something, maybe it could be through nature, to look at a sunset or to look at some beautiful ocean or a lake. But we're going to do it with some art today. I'm going to invite you into this. And this Visio Divina experience is about you engaging with God for just two minutes with this question, God, help me to see the big picture. Help me to see more of the big picture of the beauty that you have created of what this big picture we're being invited to see to embrace in our lives. So what you're going to see is some pieces of art, and you're going to see just a little snapshot of one piece of art, and then it's going to zoom out and you'll see the whole picture of the art. And then you'll see another picture of, of just a small snapshot of the painting, and then you'll zoom out and see the entire painting. And your invitation is to, to meditate on how God might invite all of us and help all of us to see the big picture that God's inviting us to see. Okay, you willing to go for it? All right, so it's two minutes. It's going to be quiet, so it's just focus on what you see. So here we go. We're going we're gonna to watch this for just two minutes.
that was a really short experience with doing this Visio Divina, but you can imagine if you just were to take some time to ask God to speak to you through art. It's a beautiful experience that I've had before in my life. Just now, as I'm looking at that, I think of two things that stuck out to me. One, how beautiful the little snapshot was, beautiful colors, beautiful paint, but how when you saw the big picture, that little snapshot seemed even more beautiful once you saw it in the context of the whole. And I also thought about how this, this experience gave me the sense of how I can experience God in this way. And I just felt God inviting me to spend more time noticing the things that my eyes are feeling intrigued by and how God could speak to me through those things. This is an opportunity for us to think about this exact thing of what it might look like to ask God to help us see the big picture in our world and in our life. And this big picture we see in this, this snapshot in Revelation 7. So let's look back at Revelation 7. There's a second snapshot story that I want to point out. And this is uh, right where it talks about how they're at the throne proclaiming the Lamb of God. The Lamb is on the throne. There's a number of places in Scripture that this is a snapshot throwback to. It's a throwback. And I think a good one is the story of John the Baptist in John 1. John the Baptist is this prophet that comes before Jesus. He happens to be John. John, John happens to be Jesus' cousin. And listen to what he says when he lays eyes on Jesus in front of a bunch of people. John 1, starting in verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him, and he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water is that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. This big story at the end, the big picture story, goes back to the snapshot. This moment where John says, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I just find that this is such a great invitation for us to realize yet again that Jesus makes it possible for us to restore our relationship with God, but also our relationship with others. We're often talking about this, how God invites us to love God and love our neighbor, right? And Jesus is the one that makes that possible through his death and resurrection and conquering death and removing these barriers that we have. Because doesn't it feel like there's barriers between us and God sometimes? Definitely, and it feels like there's barriers between us and other people, even people who are similar to us. But what Jesus has done has made a way for us to have these relationships again. And I think that's this invitation for us, to take away the sin of the world. The sin of each individual, yes, but the sin of the world, the brokenness of the world that keeps us from being able to see the beauty in the big picture and keeps us focusing on our little snapshot of our own specific cultures. And then I think there's an invitation here, and this is, this is an important one in my mind, to pray that God would lead us to intentional intercultural relationships. You guys, this is a prayer that I have prayed before, and I've, I've engaged with other people who have earnestly prayed this prayer. And every time people have earnestly prayed this prayer, if they're willing to be patient and to be faithful and to have courage, God has done amazing things with this prayer in people's lives. To turn to God and say, God, lead me to what this might look like. Because without your leadership, without your Holy Spirit, I don't know that I can do it. I have seen God do some amazing things. And if that prayer makes you feel a little bit uncomfortable, a little bit anxious, that's okay. This intercultural competence class would be a great next step in helping that anxiety come down. Of course, it's totally normal when we engage with people that are different than us that there's some anxiety. And so I really encourage people to think that, about that. All right, so then there's a final snapshot, and this one I want to hang with for just a little bit longer, okay? And this is, I think you see pretty clearly, if you put this, the Revelation 7 back up there, the people are holding palm branches in their hand. So this is a snapshot going back to Palm Sunday, or sometimes we call it the triumphal entry, when Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, probably about a week before he goes to the cross, as king. He's riding in on a donkey, right? Let me read the story for you right out of John 12, okay? So if you have a Bible, we'll look at John 12. Otherwise, we'll just have that one up for you too. This is how it's described in John 12. The next day, a great crowd had come for this festival and heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! And they're waving these palm branches just like we see in this picture in Revelation 7. 
people are waving their palm branches. So what are the people saying when they're in the story? Jesus is riding in on a donkey, and the people are laying their coats down. The, the donkey is walking over the coats. And what are they yelling? Come on, you're with me. Hosanna, right, which means save us, which means we need to be saved. And then what do we see here in Revelation 7? The people are singing in Revelation 7, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And it's the same root word, Hosanna, the Hebrew word that means save us. And so we see these pictures of these people crying out, saying save us, and then this beautiful picture of we've experienced salvation and it belongs to our God. Do you see how that snapshot gives us this invitation? I think it gives us a few specific invitations, and this is the one that sticks out to me. Do we have enough humility to know that we need to be saved? Do we have enough humility to know that we need to be saved? This is a hard one, you guys, if you ask me. And I definitely mean uh, saved in a saving relationship with Jesus, but what about just like the daily reality of needing to be saved? <laughs> to be saved from ourselves, to be saved from each other, from the broken systems in our world. I put the news on for like just a little bit, and I'm like, oh man, we need a savior. This week, there was just this, this, this experience that helped me to see how much I need to be saved and how much I need a savior in my life. There was a, a influential, some influential Christian leaders who said some super sexist and super racist things. And because it's 2019, it got on video. And because it's on video, what happens? It goes viral. Okay, so all these people are hearing these things echoed and echoed. And you guys, I just wanted to ignore it because there were some things that were said that felt super personal to me and to people that I love. And so I couldn't ignore it, right, because it went viral. It's really hard to ignore things that go viral. But here's where I saw the need for a savior. I thought, man, if these men felt like they needed to say those things to put other people down, then they probably need some healing in their life, right? They need some healing. But then I pre pretty quickly realized the anger that I felt and the, the feelings of, of just frustration, well, man, that, that shows that I need some healing in my life. And there's no way that people who I disagree with or who I'm frustrated with, there's no way that I'm going to see them as my brothers and sisters made in the image of God without God's saving grace in my life. There's just no way. I don't know about you, but I can't do it. I actually need a Savior to help me to understand people who are different than me and help me to understand the differences that we have and to see that other people, even if they say hurtful things to me or about me, are just God's kids who are broken kids, broken people, just like me, who need Jesus. That became really real to me this week as I was thinking about this. I see this in my life all the time. I see it in my unforgiveness. I see it in my egocentrism, in my ethnocentrism. I see it in the bias that I don't even realize I have, and then the bias I know I have, and I don't do anything about it. I see it in the, the impetus that I have towards racism and so many other isms. Here's what I know. We can and we will grow. I have seen so much growth in my own life and other people's lives, but we can't save ourselves. Do you see the difference between being able to pursue growth and being able to save yourself from the brokenness of this world? We can't do it. We can pursue this growth. It's going to happen. But I think that leads us to this next question. Do we have enough humility to recognize that we will always have more to learn? In a very educated world, when we value education, it's hard to say I still have more to learn but we definitely still have more to learn. When we use the phrase intercultural humility, we mean that. We mean taking a posture of someone who has more to learn. And every single one of us can have more to learn. Here's one of my favorite places to start when it comes to wanting to grow and to learn when it comes to people who are different than us. Uh, my friend Graham started something called the Global Church Project. The Global Church Project. I think Brian has got a screen, so you can kind of see the screenshot of the website. Graham is a, a theologian from Australia, so we've met on video, but we've never met in real life, or IRL, as the kids say, hashtag. And so Graham is this wonderful theologian, wonderful man. He's done this project completely funding it himself. He doesn't get paid. This is a labor of love and a passion for him to tell stories of God's church all over the world. At this point, there's 140 videos, little 10-minute videos you can watch. There's a podcast. There's multiple books. The resources are endless. This is a great place to just start, to take a little snapshot that you have of your world and to take it a little bit bigger picture to the world that God loves. So I love that as, a, as one place to start. There's many other places. Considering to go on this trip to the DR with Ramon and Kathy and some of our other leaders, that's not for everybody. That's not what everyone might feel called to right now. But wouldn't that be a great way to take a snapshot of our life and back up and see a bigger picture of the story that God's telling around the world? 
so encouraging that that's an opportunity. So I think it brings it to this final question. Will we follow the Prince of Peace and pursue empathy? Jesus is riding into Jerusalem in this way that would have made everybody think about kingship and, and a prince. But he's not riding on a stallion, he's riding on a donkey. And he's not riding in with a crown, he's riding in with tears that he sheds later that day out of love for the brokenness in Jerusalem and how much he loves these people. He's not riding in to be this victorious king of an empire who's going to take over with might and violence, even though some people want him to do that. But we know the story, don't we? He comes in and he wants to lead as a king, as a prince of peace, of humility, of a willingness to, to lay down his life. Jesus is the prince of peace. This lamb is an intentional vision being worshipped in Revelation 7. The prince of peace or the prince of shalom. Some of you have heard this word shalom before. It's a deep, powerful word in Hebrew that means a lot. But it's, it's like everything wrong being made right would be the experience of shalom or peace. Whenever there's something wrong between two people and that begins to be made right, that's shalom coming between two people. And if Jesus is the prince of peace and we follow our prince of peace, then we are invitors, right? Not the same as peacekeepers. That's pretty passive. But peacemakers. And there is so much around the commitment of being a peacemaker. I think we're going to talk about that as we go into these next few months and into next year. What does it mean to be people who say, I want to be a peacemaker? But there's one thing I want to highlight today that is actually really fascinating. Sociologists, psychologists are all talking about what they see as one of the keys to unlock peacemaking in the world today. When it comes to all the conflict in the world, when it comes to the divisiveness, the inability to really sit down face to face with people who are different than you and be people who work together, there's something that people are saying is the key to unlock peacemaking in the world, and that is empathy. You guys, this is so fascinating what's happening here. There's three types of empathy that people often talk about in these studies. Emotional empathy, which is probably what you're familiar with when you think of empathy. This idea of feeling with somebody, feeling as though you have the emotions that they are feeling. Then there's cognitive empathy. This is more about trying to understand their perspective and where they're coming from more intellectually than emotionally. And then there's compassionate empathy. That's feeling the concern, trying to understand the concern, and then allowing that to move to some sort of action. Maybe it's even a small action like uh, praying for that group of people or that person. It might be a larger action of participating in justice or sacrificial giving of time or finances or energy. But this, this, this move towards some form of action, not just feeling or thinking. And so this has been something really fascinating that sociologists and psychologists are talking about. To the point where we're seeing these experiments all over. The, you're going to start noticing this now. Watch. You're going to see the experiments all over the place. Did you know that they have now virtual reality empathy systems, okay? Peace building through virtual reality, where people can put on the vi virtual reality. I get motion sick when I do that, but if you were to do that, and then you, like, literally, literally, not literally as in literally, but as in figuratively, walk your, through people's, as you're, though you're in their shoes, right? You see the world as though they see it. This is one of the experiments in growing empathy. Then they measure whether or not people grow in empathy. Crazy. There is a movement towards empathy building through museums, you guys, museums, art museums, like we were talking about earlier. The Minnesota Institute of Art is a part of what they call the Center for Empathy and the Visual Arts. How art tells stories and stories help people grow in empathy. It's really fascinating. But here's maybe the easiest one for all of us when it comes to empathy building in our life. And that is empathy building through reading and listening to stories. I mean, it seems so simple, but time and time again, they're able to study that people grow in empathy when they listen to someone else's story, either audibly being told, or when they read someone's story. There's even some studies that if you read someone else's story out loud, you'll have an even greater growth of empathy in your life. So reading out loud to your kids or reading out loud to each other is an empathy-building activity for people. And so the invitation I want to offer to you is just think about this last week. I bet you all heard many different stories. I know I did. How many of those stories were stories of people that are similar to you in a similar background to you or have similar perspectives that already agree with your perspective? It's okay to listen to those stories, but a very simple practice would be to intentionally listen to some stories from people that are different than you. And we've never had more opportunity for that as we do right now. When it, whether it's our neighbors who are very different than us 
or podcasts or books and resources. There's so many. But we have this opportunity to grow in this empathy, and I think it can go a long way, as Mike talked about last week, when we think about the input of the stories we take in in our life. So the encouragement is that we can grow in this just by considering the stories we're listening to and the ways that it allows us to, to have emotional empathy, cognitive empathy, and then maybe move to compassionate empathy in our lives. The Prince of Peace invites us into that. There's nothing that's more clear than, of Jesus' empathy than going to the cross to take on the brokenness of the world. So I'm going to give you one final challenge. This is a, not a challenge for the faint of heart. Okay, so I, I want to warn you about that. And that is to think about a group of people that you know God might be inviting you to grow in empathy for and to pray that God would help you grow in empathy with this group of people. This is a risky prayer. To pray that God would help you grow in empathy to a group of people. I don't know what group of people it needs to be for you. But I know that it's risky because I've done it in my own life. I've prayed that God would help me to have empathy for a group of people that's different than me. And it has been one of the most meaningful things in my life, but it's also been one of the most disturbing. I literally had an actual nightmare a few weeks ago where I woke up in the middle of the night and I was thinking about this group of people and I remembered that prayer that I prayed and I was able to experience what I can best describe as a broken heart. But I stand here today and I tell you, even with that, it's worth it. It's worth it to be people who have that empathy so that we can embrace God's gift of a multicultural and a multi-ethnic humanity. It's not going to be an easy road, but I want to say that I think it's worth it. Broken hearts and all, I think it's worth it. The band can come up, and um, we're going to sing a couple songs, and the song that they're going to sing has these lyrics that I want to read to you. Every once in a while, I think we miss the lyrics as we're coming for communion. I want to read this to you. Spirit of God, fall fresh on us. We need your presence. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. A miracle can happen now, for the spirit of the Lord is here. We know that this curse of racism and division is always going to be with us in some way until that future vision in Revelation 7 is true. And we will then have our whole lives to choose to join God in reversing that curse. And it's not going to be easy, but we have access to the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God, fall fresh on us. We want to see your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, as it's described in this new creation in Revelation 7. We want to see that, don't we? A miracle can happen now. Listen, every time there's an experience of peace building, that's a miracle. And I believe the Holy Spirit's involved. Every time division is between people and God makes that wrong thing right, the Holy Spirit has done a miracle. I'm not trying to make light of a miracle. I'm saying this is what God does. And someday we'll experience all of that, all of the wrong things being made right fully and completely as we see here in this story. And so I want to end this sermon, I want to end this conversation actually reading just the very end of Revelation 7, where we see a little bit more description of these people, every tongue and tribe and nation. They're standing together, and this is said of them. And so if you're willing, just to close your eyes, I'm going to read this. Imagine some of the deepest pain caused by this curse. Imagine some of the deepest pain caused by the brokenness in this world. The things that people need, the things that people don't have their needs met, the, the wrong things, the, the things that need to be made right. And then recognize in this that I'm about to read that this is the future promise for anyone here who wants to choose to give their life to the Prince of Peace. This is the way these people are described. These people are coming from a time of great suffering and affliction. They've washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, cleansing them. Responding out of a heart filled with praise, they congregate before the throne of God and constantly worship God day and night. The one seated on the throne, Jesus, will always live among them. They will never be hungry or thirsty again. The sun or blazing heat will never scorch them because the lamb who stands at the center of the throne is their shepherd and they are his sheep and he will lead them to the water of life and God will dry every tear from their eyes. Amen. <laughs>